All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening, good evening. Um, thanks very much for coming out tonight. Yeah, I think we're rolling here. Um, so tonight I wanted to sort of do a slight mix. I wanted to go backwards a little bit and talk about Luther, Martin Luther, because for all the thinkers we've looked at, he is really a prime influence uh, in the German socio-historical, philosophical, linguistic program. Um, but I wasn't sure where to fit him in. So I thought tonight would be a good night because famously, uh, at the beginning of Thus Spake Zarathustra, Zarathustra comes down from the mountain, he runs into a hermit who's been living in the woods. And he says, well, what have you been doing here, Mr. Hermit? And he says, oh, I've been singing my praises to God. I've been writing hymns to the God. I've been praying to God. It's all been wonderful. But don't go down the valley because it's terrible down there because there's people down there. You should, <laughs> you should stay here and just praise God with me because I remember you from going up the mountain. And Zarathustra says, oh, hey, thanks, that's great, but I'll, you know, I'm going to head on down the hill, and you knock yourself out there, buddy. Uh, I paraphrase. And then he goes down the hill, and as soon as he gets away from where the hermit is, he turns and says, has he not heard that God is dead? Right? Has the message not gotten to him that God is dead? What's important to note here is Nietzsche means the God of Luther. It's Luther's God that Nietzsche thinks is dead. It's a very specific God. He's not really in favor of gods at all, as we'll see. But he, when, he, when he says God is dead, it means Luther's God is dead, which turns out to also be the God of Kant, Hegel, and Schopenhauer. And then Kierkegaard is next time. It's also the God of Kierkegaard. Right? And so I just want to take a pause and understand what Luther did and what he created and how he influenced all these thinkers and why Nietzsche would go so far out of his way to make sure that people knew that God, and Luther's God in particular, is the one that's died. So, what did Luther do? So Luther, of course, is a 99 thesis. He kicks off the Protestant Reformation. What's important to note about him is that he wasn't particularly original in what he was saying. He's just the guy that made it stick. He's the guy that was able, because he was a brilliant writer, uh, fearless, basically, because if many times he faced death, um, and was able to just really push this. And he wrote a lot, an immense, an unimaginable amount, much of it very um, tedious, much of it incredibly offensive, a horrible anti-Semite, not really a lot of pleasant things to say about women, even for the time period, uh, which is impressive <laughs> achievement. You know, uh, at that one point he says that, you know, if, if women don't want to keep giving birth because they're afraid they're going to die, but well, that's what they're for, so they should just keep going. Right. And you're like, well, that's very sensitive of him. Uh, you know, so uh, but so, you know, so a lot of suspect material there, certainly not a modern progressive. Let's put it that way. But what he did do is pretty remarkable. And so let me quote here first. And this is from his speech, The Diet of Worms. So he's there basically trying not to be burnt as a heretic. And they're saying recant and we won't burn you as a heretic. And he basically says no. Um, but he says, unless I'm convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradict themselves, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Now this is the revolutionary doctrine. People talk about the whole indulgence things, which is true, as opposed to the Pope selling indulgences, which is just kind of a tax. But what he really is articulating here is you read the scriptures, you decide what they say, and then you act on your conscience. The Pope is not the interpreter of the Bible. You are. Now, this is an incredible promotion, world historically. Almost all world religions, for almost the entirety of human history up to this point, you had ecclesiastical authorities, priests, prophets. Uh, uh, you know, the king was often coterminous with the head of the religion of your culture. And those people were special. They were sanctioned. You did what they said. They determined what religion meant, how you practiced, what you did. 
When you went to the Oracle of Delphi, you didn't say to the Oracle, look, Delphi, let me tell you. <laughs> right? It was the other way around. You're going for the Oracle of Delphi for the Oracle to tell you what to do. And that had to be interpreted by the priests and priestesses at the Oracle of Delphi. So it was like two steps removed. So the Catholic Church, of course, embodied this hierarchy very much like all of the other civilizations in world history. There's a few notable exceptions, but generally speaking, this is the pattern. And so when Luther says, look, you can read the word of God like I have and decide for yourself what it means. And then when you do it, you can stand in front of the pope. And, well, the representatives of the pope, of course, the pope didn't come and the Holy Roman Emperor and everybody else and say, no, I look, I've read the scriptures, this is what they say, show me where it says different in the book and I'll behave differently. And this just threw off the hierarchy completely. It promotes you from a subject of the ecclesiastical authorities who speak on behalf of God to someone who can speak or read or contact directly through prayer and meditation, but most importantly in this case through the Bible, to the God, I mean, just per one to one. It, so ecclesiastical authority goes away, theoretically, of course, um, and you get promoted to the front of the class. And so people did not experience this as, oh, one religious structure being substituted for another religious structure. They experienced this as unbelievable liberation. It was like, oh, I've been freed from these ecclesiastical authority and given this direct access to God. That's pretty good, right? That's a really big transformation in how people understood their relationship with the divine. So as part of that, he also then translated, he was the first person to translate into high quality German from the Greek and the Hebrew. There had been bad versions of the Bible translated into really crappy German but they were translated from the Vulgate with a Latin translation of the Hebrew and the Greek. And so they were hard to read. They're poorly written by German standards in the German itself. Um, and they weren't from the original texts. Luther goes back as part of this program, goes to the original text and produces a beautiful, the most influential text on the German language is Luther's Bible by far. It's not even close second. He's, it's like if Shakespeare uh, and I don't know, it's like all of our great writers were all one writer. I mean, that's the kind of impact that Luther had. It was amazingly powerful. He basically created modern high German. I mean, it, was, it grows out of this. So Goethe, Nietzsche, for instance, uh, praised him highly. And so he not only said this, but he produced the book that allowed you, the layperson, to go out and read and decide for yourself, again, in theory, uh, what it meant. And so I get this great quote here from a contemporary of Luther. He says, Luther's New Testament was so much multiplied and spread by printers that even tailors and shoemakers, yea, even women <laughs> and ignorant persons who had accepted this new Lutheran gospel and could read a little German, studied it with the greatest avidity as the foundation of all truth. Some committed it to memory and carried about in their bosom. In a few months, such people deemed themselves so learned that they were not ashamed to dispute about faith and the gospel, not only with Catholic laymen, but even with priests and monks and doctors of divinity. <laughs> oh, wait a second now. Now that I can read the book, you can't just tell me what's in there. And this starts the doctrinal and schismatic fissures that have been in uh, Protestant Christianity ever since. People always say, oh, what is true Christianity? Since Luther, there is no such thing. There's absolutely no response to that question because everything is open to interpretation. And because the Bible is such an incredible grab bag, you can select whatever you want to select and go, look, there you go. But you just deselected, you know, a bunch of other material, and then you can just you could do that and make any basically you make anything you want, a sort of paint paint by numbers um, program. But this was Luther's action, and so this carried with a lot of elements to it. So one, you're promoted now; you have access to God if you learn this book. That's the, one of the big keys, and so people really wanted to learn to read. It was a huge impetus towards literacy. 
And so all kinds of schools are set up. The schools that Kant and Hegel and Schopenhauer, to a lesser extent, attended, many of them were founded and funded and developed, in the first instance, as attempts to spread Luther's gospel, to train uh, priests and ministers for, uh, to be priests of, of, of the different Lutheran sects. And then once you get like the schismatic switch of all the different versions, Calvinism, Lutheranism, other kinds of Protestantism, what you end up with is different schools have to be founded to train different people to teach different versions of the text under different assumptions about how this all works. And so what you end up with is this kind of crazy hodgepodge of educational institutions which are directed towards developing teachers and priests who can spread a specific version of the interpretation of the Old or the New Testament. And so now you have not just literacy spreading and interpretation spreading, but priests basically, or ministers basically become <coughs> teachers. So sermons become teaching opportunities. So you go from, and this is the trans, this is like total transformation from a Catholic mass, which is in a language you don't know. You have no idea what this person is saying. What are they talking about? What are they trying to achieve? You're just there to perform as they tell you. To an institution that is basically educational. Wants you to be literate and wants you to read this book and then wants to fight about what it means when you read the book, right? <laughs> and theoretically, your interpretation is as good as anybody else's, but functionally, it's really best if you color within the lines, right? But, but theoretically, it was very liberatory. And so, uh, and finally, it was also in German, not in Latin, which made the German people really happy because when you're dominated by a political structure, essentially a, a civic structure, that is not even in your language, by people who are often foreign, this doesn't make you happy. It makes you feel alienated. And so now you have a structure that's in your language that you can read, that invites you to learn, tells you to get literate, and says, hey, talk to God. Wow, boom, everybody's mind blown. People are like, wow, why did Protestantism spread so fast? I'm like, how, I mean, once you come up with that, this is hugely popular. But again, this gentleman articulates the problem. Now everybody thinks they know what's in the Bible because they can read it. <laughs> and so now we've got trouble, right? Now we have all this stuff. <laughs> and so fast forward a couple hundred years, you get Kant. Kant is in these educational institutions that were founded to train various flavors of Lutheran, Calvinist. Again, there's all different schools to preach the true version of the Gospels. But of course, they had sort of wandered off at this point. They're starting to, some universities are starting to teach science. So it was all confused and messy. But at the core of it was this liberation of the individual to access the divine themselves. And so when Kant writes the critique of pure reason, what he's saying is no reason alone won't get you there. When Hegel says there's this divine element in history that can be active in you and is active in the world. This is, this, you know, it's, it's a version of Lutheranism because it says there is this divine force in the world which you can access and can influence you. When Schopenhauer comes along and says something that's not that dissimilar in many ways to what Hegel is arguing, to what Kant is talking about, they all want to maintain this direct access between you and a divine that you can get to by thinking and reasoning and studying and reflecting and having faith. It's there. You can reach it if you do the right things. Now, Schopenhauer, Hegel, Kant, and of course Luther all would disagree about what the right thing is, <laughs> but it's there for you. And so this is one thing that differentiates um, like the French Enlightenment. They were hugely anti-Catholic, but they weren't necessarily anti-religion. They weren't anti-God as much as they were anti-Catholic church. Modern time, we tend to put those together. But the whole point of criticizing Catholic Church was to take those apart, to say, look, no, no, you don't represent the real God because, look, this is so silly. Same thing with England. Many of the thinkers were agnostic, they're deists, right? But they tended not to be just straight atheists. That's a very rare, in fact, the word atheist doesn't come along until much later. It's a rare concept. Um, and so 
And in the German Enlightenment, they associated Enlightenment essentially with Lutheranism because that was what the beginning of freeing your mind from Catholic domination was. That's what Lutheranism achieved. So Nietzsche comes along, and in early life, he's pretty pro-Luther for these specific reasons, and he also thinks Luther is the best writer in the German language, which is probably true. Luther, Goethe, and Nietzsche, by the way, are the big three. Um, you know, they're the really, really great writers of German. But these heroic achievements by Luther and his, and his, and his personal bravery in the face of sort of uh, being burned or, or imprisoned or all these other problems that he faced it, it was pretty impressive. But then he moves decisively against him as his philosophy develops. And his middle and later philosophy is aggressively and specifically anti-Luther. Because what he wants to do, and this is the crucial shift that we still struggle with today, is he wants to say, look, God is dead. Not the Catholic Church, not Lutheranism, not Calvinism, not Buddhism or Hinduism. No. God, the gods, all of them, dead. They're done for. Get rid of them. Kant's concept of the beyond. That's dead too, as is Hegel's, dead. Schopenhauer's, this was his big break with Schopenhauer. Nietzsche really loved Schopenhauer and then he had to break with him intellectually because he realized, no, this transcendent thing is dead. That whole notion, what he called the world behind, the, the hidden world, the invisible world, the world of the next thing, of the next idea, of the, Im, the spirit, sort of the airy spiritual world that's out there, no, zero, dead does not exist. And so he tries to draw a really hard line there, and this upset a lot of people. Because they didn't feel like this was a liberation, they felt like it was a demotion. Hey, we just, we, we can contact the spiritual. He says, no, you can't, you can't. It's not there. You can't, yeah. No, you, you can't, you can't. You can't, you can't do it, it's not there. And so some of the key quotes from Nietzsche here, where he makes no doubt about this, he says, to the despisers of the body, I will speak my word. And by despisers of the body, he means people who think that the body is something that's just sort of, ooh, and you know, whatever, but that we have this soul, and we have this eternal essence that really is better and more important and the, the spiritual greatness of us. Nietzsche says, no, absolutely no use for this at all. He says, to the despisers of the body, I will speak my word. I wish them neither to learn afresh nor teach anew, but only to bid farewell to their own bodies and thus be dumb which is to say, be dead. If you don't like your body, get rid of it, and that'll work for everybody. Um, <laughs> body am I and soul, so saith the child. And why should not one, one not speak like a ch children? But the awakened one, the knowing one, saith, body am I entirely and nothing more. And the soul is only the name of something in the body. See, when you, you say a soul or spirit, whatever, that's just a part of your body. It's not better than, it's not beyond than, it's just part of it. And the German by this is perfectly clear, by the way, because it's, uh, it's Hinterwelt, it's, it's the behind or hidden world that he uses. Hinter just meaning behind or, or beyond. And so he's saying, look, that just does not exist. It's, there's nothing beyond or behind or under or inside or invisible about the body. It's just the body. The body is a big nothing more, and the soul is only the name of something in the body. The body is a big sagacity, a plurality with one sense, a war and a peace, a flock and a shepherd. An instrument of thy body is also like a little sagacity, my brother, which thou callest spirit, a little instrument and plaything of the big sagacity. So maybe you have a spirit, but it's just this little thing, this little silliness inside the rest of the body, which is the big important thing. Ego, sayest thou, art proud of the word, but the greater thing in which thou art unwilling to believe is thy body, with its big sagacity. It saith not ego, but doeth it. What the sense feeleth, what the spirit discerneth, hath never its end in itself, but sense and spirit would fain persuade thee that they are the end of all things. So vain are thee. Instruments and playthings are sense and spirit. Behind them there is still the self. The self seeketh with the eyes of the senses, it hearkeneth also with the ears of the spirit." This has specifically been translated, this is an older translation, to mimic the language of Luther that Nietzsche was mimicking in the German. He uses Luther's language, that biblical uh, sort of King James language in, in English, to try and say, because he's specifically writing like Luther to say very anti-Lutheran things. 
And he's saying, look, no, it's the body. The body is the wise thing. Believe in your body. Believe in your senses. Trust yourself. There is, no, there is nothing beyond you. There is no greater sense of things. Uh, and generally speaking, we hate this idea. Um, and he, he extends this, and he says, Remain faithful to the earth, my brothers, with the power of your virtue. Let your gift-giving love and your knowledge serve the meaning of the earth. Thus I beg and beseech you, do not let them fly away from earthly things and beat their wings against eternal walls. Alas, there has always been so much virtue that has flown away. Lead back to the earth the virtue that flew away as I do, back to the body, back to life, that it may give the earth a meaning, a human meaning. So, oh, broken earth, fallen earth, dirty planet, oh, it's so bad. But there's some eternal, there's an Eden, a lost paradise, either in the past or the future or in heaven, or that God is going to dispense or our spirit's going to rise to. And he's just like, that is all crap. Just <laughs> wash that out of your mind. Love your body and love the earth. That is wisdom. This is what Zarathustra says, which is just Nietzsche. And he's saying, but to do that, to really do that, you have to let go of all of this other notions, all of these abstractions, all of these invisible concepts, all of this imaginings about other worlds and other worlds, heavens and hells and forgiveness. And it's like, Phew. no. And, and again, we really, really struggle with this because our narratives, because one of the great human powers, as Nietzsche and everybody else recognizes, is the imagination. What a wonderful, incredible, probably the greatest survival tool ever developed. Because it allows you to play out scenarios. Oh, if I do that and that, and then the lion is going to eat me. Well, if I do this and this, and I fall off a cliff. If I do that and that, I get a coconut. Let's do this. Right? You know, and you can sort of imagine out. So some, some, some biologists speculate this would be the evolutionary use of imagination. That once you get that capacity to sort of run scenarios in your mind, that's a huge survival advantage. But it also allows you to imagine counterfactual things. Things that, that really are not helpful to you. And he's just like, yeah, you've got to let go of that spirit world. Everything that Hegel and Schopenhauer and Kant and Luther are trying to give you, you have to say no. You have to say, I embrace my body, which is to say I embrace the here and the now, the physical thing that I inhabit. And I have to embrace the earth here and now. In fact, there's an amazing strain of environmentalism in Nietzsche's writing because he so repeatedly insists on loving the earth, specifically. There isn't, you don't pursue abstractions, you pursue the concrete. And once you start looking at the concrete, what are you stuck with? You're stuck with a planet, a tree, a rock, a meadow, a stream. And you go, is this good? Does it work? Is it healthy? And he says, when you ask those kinds of questions, you, what you achieve is a completely different sort of sense of the world. Because now you're not worried about a world beyond or a world behind. You're worried about this world here as it is. The functioning world that we inhabit with our functioning bodies. But if you, again, if you look back historically, now we've gotten rid of the Catholic hierarchy or in other religious, all of the religions, all of the religious authorities that were dominant over you. And then we say, oh, we're going to then take away any sense of the invisible spiritual. And for many, many people, this turns out to be like being set free in a desert. Well, you're free, but we leave you in a desert. And so people desperately, desperately want to fill that. And it seems almost inevitably they fill it with something that is exactly like Lutheranism, except they don't call it that. So you can call it anything you want, but we'll first call it others. Again, brilliant historian, I think I mentioned before, Burley, and he wrote, it's called The New History of the Third Reich, in which he argues that essentially uh, to understand Nazism and Soviet style communism, you just have to understand that they're just religions. They're just medieval religions. And once you read it this way, he says lots of stuff becomes clear. And that these people who felt like they had been robbed of their capacity to believe in something, found something that they could believe in, fascism or communism. 
And then it just functioned exactly, I mean, he just lists it, it functions exactly like, like a medieval hierarchical religion. And that makes people really happy. Because <laughs> otherwise we're stuck with ourselves and our planet. And for some reason that's not satisfying. I'm not sure why, but this is, this is a historic history makes this very clear. That we want something beyond ourselves to believe in. People actually say that in so many words. I want something beyond me to believe in. And Nietzsche's like, no, you don't. I mean, you think you do, but you really shouldn't. And so his argument is quite radical. And this is one reason people struggle with understanding Nietzsche is because the liberation that, that Luther gave us, which is the liberation to choose our own spiritual path, Nietzsche wants to kill. He says, no, get rid of, there are no spiritual paths. Stop that. They're all the same path and they all lead to a bad place. Don't go down any of them. And people, again, people hate this message. Uh, and, and so what he wants to substitute for this, again, we tend to find unsatisfying. What does he substitute? One, he says, look, you, like I said, your body. You're the substitute for God. You're not God. You're not a God. But in that empty space, put yourself. And then who makes the rules? Well, God makes the rules, which is now you. Congratulations, you've been promoted. <laughs> and we're like, ah, oh, how do I know I'm making the right rules? And so one of the consistent criticisms you'll find of Nietzsche's philosophy is people say he has no system, which is maybe fair, except for his system is to trust you to come up with your own system. That's his system, which is not really a very systematic system, but it is to say that the best one is the one that each individual comes up with for themselves. Then you have a good system because there is no particular system. And you judge it against yourself. The system you come up with, you measure. How does it make my body feel? How, it, it, am I being more or less healthful? Am I being more vibrant? How does it make the earth around me function? Is, is, it, is it helping the earth, the planet, my community? Am I feeling more engaged, more enriched, more, more invigorated? Is it more beautiful or less? You have to decide. And it's this interesting, really profound struggle, which is what Nietzsche says. He said, this is a profound struggle. So when he talks about the overman or the uberman, ubermensch, which you, you, you may have heard about, we tend to imagine that he's talking about some you know, mighty warrior with a sword, and he occasionally uses that language, but it is because you're fighting your versions of yourself. Almost invariably, not quite, but most of the time that he talks about fighting and killing, he means fighting and killing yourself, versions of yourself. You're not going to just get up one morning and go, oh yeah, I've got rid of all that stuff, and now I can just move on with this new program. This is not going to, he says, when that happens, what you've done is you've just substituted one vain idol for another vain idol. That's easy. We have no problem doing that. I can switch. In fact, uh, it, the great statistics on American religion is people change religions all the time. It's at a really incredible pace, which is I, it's like a, a, a buffet of religion. Right? One day I go and I get the soup and salad, and the next day I think, oh, I'll get something else. Right? And, then, and, that is, and, and so it's like, I think average American changes religion like two and a half times in their lifetime, which is just amazing. So you're born into one, you're Baptist, and you decide to be Catholic, and then later you go, no, I think I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> right? And, and, and Nietzsche says, well, okay, but yeah, this is just three idols, and you've just swapped them around. You liberate yourself, not by looking outside, but by looking to you and, again, the earth. So it seems simple. Oh, we hate that. We really do. And then, as Burley, the historian, and other people have pointed out, so you get rid of those religious idols, and so the next thing you do is you come up with nationalism. By the way, it is no coincidence that nationalism was rising with the Protestant Reformation. They rise together. So Catholicism becomes French Catholicism. It's not European Catholicism, it's French Catholicism. So the Germans are struggling with their Catholic minorities. The French are trying to get rid of their Protestants as fast as they can. And in England, they're trying to get rid of their, all the Catholic laws and stuff. 
because the nationalism now displaces the religious cover. And so you want to repress those minorities and organize around a single quote-unquote state religion because it's really the state that now is the religion. And so people, and this makes people really happy. That's the thing. People are like, yes, now I'm part of something. I'm part of something bigger than me. And Nietzsche's like, no, 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 no. Stop that. You're not part of anything bigger than you because there's nothing bigger than you. There's you, and then there's the earth, which you should embrace around you, but there's not bigger, more important, vaster. Those are just abstractions. And the more you feed the abstraction, the less you're feeding yourself. But then when you say this, which was criticism, again, level that needs you consistently, it's like, well, well, then people are just going to be crazy. <coughs> right? And he's like, maybe some people. And it's almost this litmus, litmus test on what people think about other people, which I always think is a reflection on what they think about themselves. Oh, well, won't people just go around and steal stuff and kill people and rape people and just do It's like, really? Is that what you really want to do? They're like, wow. <coughs> If I really couldn't go grocery shopping, I'd really prefer to go just steal a bunch of shit and burn something down. <laughs> Not really. It sounds troublesome to me, right, and disruptive of society. And the fact that we tend to live together, on average, very happily and communally, um, is a sign that most people, most of the time, really don't seem to want to do this. And, and so what happens, though, communally, and this is what Nietzsche hated about nationalism in particular, and German nationalism very particularly, was all of these people subsume themselves, just they had under Catholicism, <coughs> to a new god, the state, and this feeds the worst people. This is always his argument. N now you get the worst people running the place. Because everybody has made themselves small and given over all of their power and beliefs to some abstract structure that they don't control. Right? How does the Pope become the whore of Babylon? Well, who's in charge? What restrictions are on them? Not many. Pope is not dangerous as an individual. He's dangerous potentially as the head of, of a huge institution that's carrying on burnings and wars and purgatory, you know, all this sort of terrible stuff. Inquisition, which, again, I always think of the Inquisition as being like, you know, 20 years long. It was like 400 years long. It, was just, it, just, it just went on and on and on and on. It was mostly about killing Jews, of course, the great historical pastime. Um, you know, that, that they're rooting out the, 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 the sort of Jews that they thought had probably converted, but not really. Right, and so this was a big, big focus of, of the Inquisition. So that went on for you know a couple of centuries. Um, but because people believed, I mean, it's just that simple. It says until you stop believing, the, the structures don't change; they don't relent. And instead of asking, "What other structure can I believe in to replace the structure that I believe in now?" Nietzsche specifically, as we've read here and as just throughout uh, his writing, particularly his middle and late period writing, he says, why not believe in you? Believe in you and what you can feel and sense around you. And I always try to think of, of times when we do things that we feel and we know, well, ooh, this is not good, but I'm going to put up with it because of this a goal, an end, something greater. Now again, this is the great power of humanity. We can imagine a different outcome. We can pursue it and think about it. And we can actually underdo things that animals would never do. Um, my favorite example is, anybody seen these competitions where people stand there with their fingers on a car and then the last person standing there gets the car? Now this, this is amazing, because of course now you're just in a suffering competition. The person who can suffer the longest will get a car. And I'm like, wow, human beings are amazing. 
Because generally speaking in the animal kingdom, you don't see this. It's this abstract concept of a good that we can, which is not to say that this is, by the way, necessarily bad. Sometimes it is good to do this. Sometimes it is not good to do this. But who's making that decision whether or not something is good for us? Generally, it's not us. This is made by our communities. So I always go back to education because that's where I, I, I live. And so I go, right. Well, again, the, the stories about school kids who are getting like 20 minutes of class breaks a day. And so they're bringing lawsuits because that doesn't meet the state standards. They're supposed to get like 45 minutes of breaks a day for elementary school students. I don't think anybody who knows anything about kids knows that giving elementary school students 45 minutes of breaks a day is essentially child abuse. The kids want breaks. One has to imagine the teachers know the kids should have more breaks. Anybody who knows anything about child welfare knows the kids should have more breaks. The parents must suspect that their kids coming home all depressed and agitated suspect something is wrong. But what we've decided culturally is this is okay because something. They'll learn to read or they'll get higher math scores. But what we don't do is stop to ask the kids, or even ourselves, is this really a good idea? Is this really worth the outcome? The system, our educational system, our culture has said yes, which is fine. The question is, why do we believe it? We don't believe it if we ask our bodies, because we all know we would hate to do that. I always want them to try to do this to adults. I think adults would rebel. You know, that is just, it's just crazy. But, you know, communally we've decided it's okay, and so we believe in these larger abstract structures, and so we're just going to go for it. That's all right. Give the kids some Ritalin. They'll be fine. <laughs> um, but those abstractions tend, again, to rule us. We don't trust our bodies. Hey, I'm anxious and nervous, and I've been sitting here a long time. Let's go for a run. Right? Or, I'm tired, maybe it's time for a nap. Who gets to decide when we get to go to sleep? You know, it's, it's weird. You don't get to generally sleep at work. It's one of the big things I have against work, right? <laughs> it, it, it's, but, but why not, right? Take a nap. We know that's wrong. Even if theoretically you have a job where it's okay to nap, like for some reason it would be fine, if it's not, right? We know you're not supposed to. You're not supposed to drink at work, many people do, but you're not supposed to. Anything you do to make it enjoyable, probably not okay. <laughs> right? Because we think there's supposed to be some sort of suffering involved with it. <laughs> but Nietzsche wants to say, well, maybe we should trust ourselves a little more or perhaps a lot more and trust these abstract institutions and goals. It's really the abstraction that he's opposed to. A lot less. But it's, it's, it's a difficult notion. So one of the things he talks about, he goes through it sort of systematically for his age, but I think it's one important thing for us to even think about to translate in the modern world. Uh, one of the abstractions, of course, is money. One of our core abstractions is one of the abstractions that he talks about. We're, we're a culture obsessed with money. Um, and he says, yeah, but of course, money is an abstraction. It does stuff. It's a tool. It's possible to do things. But when does this abstraction become dominating? as opposed to health giving? When does it drive the abstraction takeover rather than our bodies and our sense of the environment? If you think environmentally, I think we may have tilted slightly to the money. <laughs> I have that suspicion that our pursuit of wealth may have tipped slightly against the environment. Maybe I'm crazy, right? That, that, that notion has sort of driven us clearly mad I mean, uh, there's a type of coal mining called mine top removal. I think it just says everything. Mountain top, right? Mountain top, mountain top removal. What else do you need to know? <laughs> that this is a bad idea. It's a bad idea because it's called mountain top removal. It's like elective surgery. See, that's just a bad idea. It's no, who would elect 
for surgery, right? If, you, if you're thinking elective surgery is a good idea, Nietzsche would think probably you're on the wrong track. Now, if it's necessary surgery, great. Elective surgery, mountaintop removal. What do you have to do to create something better than a mountaintop? I'm suspicious if we're going to be able to pull that off. Because you look at mountaintops, and they look really good where they are. <laughs> But we can take that mountaintop and we can make money out of it. Somebody can. And so we think, well, that's a good trade. Nietzsche is suspicious. A concrete, physical, good, beautiful, s traded for an abstraction. Bad. But you know, we do, again, time and time and time again, we get, we, we get tricked by this, that there's some invisible force, there's some conceptual notion for which I should sacrifice my well-being as opposed to trusting myself and my immediate environment and asking that is where you locate the truth. And so then along with that, which is what happened immediately, by the way, to go back to Luther briefly, so once you open up this Pandora's box, then the, the, all the sects immediately began fighting and burning heretics and killing people and having wars about who had the right version of Protestantism or Lutheranism or whatever it is. And of course, we've got the, the a million schisms that we now have. But none of them said, well, let's just get rid of it. Let's just tell everybody your version is fine. If you want to believe whatever, that's fine. Everybody's, no. See, once you go there, basically you end up sort of vaguely in Gnostic land. Uh, by the way, the Gnostics were an early attempt to sort of get rid of the hierarchy, and they were uh, unpopular for several hundred years all over the world. Um, so that, but that, the, the, this later attempt, same thing. It immediately throws up a new hierarchy. Because now if no one, if everybody has access to a Bible, how do we know who's got it right? Well, so then we have to come up with institutions that tell us who's right. Oh, well, you went to this school. You got a divinity degree. I love that notion, a divinity, a degree in God. I just love that concept. I, I want a divinity degree just so I can say, hey, I'm a God. Like, I've got proof, right? Right here, it says I'm divine. Uh, you know, uh, but it's, it's, it's that notion, right, that you and now you're a person who knows because we create an institution that tells you that you know, and then people believe in the institution, and then we're right back where we started from. With these abstract hierarchies where some people know and other people don't know, and most people are supposed to follow, and a few people have access to the truth. And some of them move to Utah with a new prophet, and they form a whole, like, you know, program, Mormonism, just a great example. Right? Because again, it's the same move. I have access to a new prophecy. After me, no more new prophecies. Right? So you, it's always an attempt to corner the market. And he just says, don't let them corner the market on you. You have the market because you are the source of the prophecy. It's in you. Trust your body, and specifically your body. He doesn't say trust your mind, although he's a big one on thinking, of course. Just trust your body. What is your body telling you? And he's specifically saying this because of course, so much of the uh, Lutheranism and Calvinism and hardcore German Protestantism that he experienced was about not trusting the body. The body is evil, it misleads you, uh, it's the gateway to sin, right? It's bad, it's ugly, it's dangerous, it needs to be uh, disciplined, right? Disciplining the body all the time as opposed to saying, no, it's glorious, it's great, it's wonderful, it's liberatory, it's the font of truth. And again, if you don't, th that this is still radical today, don't listen to me, just when somebody asks you, well, how do you know that's true, or where do you get the truth from, or what's the source of that, just say, my body. <laughs> it's what my body tells me. And people will be like, <laughs> Because we don't know what to say to that. Because we know you cannot appeal to your body as a font of truth. I'm going to tell my students to do this. Just footnote from my body. <laughs> right? That's sort of, how do you know that's true? I'm going to quote my body. Here's a picture of my back. <laughs> right? I, you know, that, that notion that this is a source 
of reason and wisdom and knowledge, we simply do not, we just don't allow, right? You can't, there's no way, you can't even footnote it. How do you appeal to it? We don't, we just don't trust it. Uh, even if, if, if you follow sports at all, I like football, um, they have all these c conflicts about, oh, well, I, I went with a team doctor, the team doctor told me something, but I didn't believe that, so I wanted to get another doctor source. And I think it's good to consult doctors, but they don't actually just trust the players. The, the players are not allowed to trust their own bodies. They say trust your own body, but then they want the doctors to tell them, they want other doctors to tell them, and they really want the, the, the teams generally to control their bodies. It's actually a big struggle in the NFL right now. Who controls the players' bodies, the players or the team's doctors? Because like, oh, the players are gonna lie to get out of having to play, or whatever, you know, suspicious of other people's bodies. But who knows your bodies better than them, particularly if you're an athlete? It's also why we know all athletes are stupid, right? Is because if you live in your body, that means you're dumb because we know there's no wisdom in the body, right? That's where that equation comes from. Oh, if you spend too much time uh, being physical, working out, biking, hiking in the mountains, wherever you're too much time with your body, your mind will atrophy. And that's the source of all knowledge and wisdom and insight and everything that's really valuable because those are all abstract. The notion of being in your body, feeling good about yourself, feeling vibrant and healthy, ah, that's concrete. And, and, and if you're paying attention to that, you it's generally, sometimes our bodies lie to us, but I think a lot of the time our bodies don't lie to us. If you're like, oh, I don't know about some situation, I often generally think if I look back on that, my body was like, no, no, no. <laughs> and I'm like, well, maybe. I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> Should have listened to the body. How dangerous could it be? How bad could it hurt? I always think that. I, I, but for some reason, it doesn't stop me. Like, that won't hurt that bad. And then it hurt, oh, that hurt really bad. Uh, you know, that, that sort of uh, uh, you know, risk take, all these sorts of things. And it's not that you should be a slave to your body. It's not what he's saying, Nietzsche's saying. It's just that consult it first and seriously and meaningfully. Take it in. And he's accentuating it, of course, because it runs counter. And by the way, he wrote this in like 1870. I mean, it sounds crazy today. In 1870, people thought he had lost his, literally thought he's losing his mind. They were like, this, you know, he's clearly this is just crazy. And by the way, he's incredibly sick. He, he, he suffered from a lot of, of, of problems, eyesight problems, migraines, digestive problems. Um, and he still said, look, yeah, trust your body. Maybe that was why, because when he was really good about his health regimes, he would be healthy. <coughs> and then something would happen, he would fall off. And he'd be like, ah, I got to get, get my body back right. And so in this arc of the Enlightenment, from Luther, the liberation of moving us close to God, now you have access to the truth. The truth is out there. Wasn't there a TV show where that was the, the truth, is, <laughs> truth is out there, Right? Nietzsche wants to say, no, 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 the truth is in there. You do have access to the truth. Not the transcendent truth, because we're trying to get rid of the transcendent. Not the eternal, immortal truth, because we're not eternal and we're not immortal, so that's stupid. But truth enough. It's inside, not outside with Kant, not outside with Hegel, not a spiritual force with Schopenhauer. Just kill all that, kill that God. And then kill the God-shaped space that's left. That's the hard part. We don't, we're not supposed to pour the state in there or money or anything other abstraction. But it's really hard. And people, again, tend to have that response of saying, what, if you do that and set people free like that, it'll be chaos. I don't know why people say that. Because it seems people are really communal. I think we'd be more communal, not less. Because if you ask people, oh, what do you want to do? Oh, I want to be with my friends. Well, why aren't you with your friends? Oh, I have to fill in something unpleasant and generally abstract. <laughs> right? But, but if you flip that around and go, well, what's going to make you feel better and be healthier? Often it's like being with the people you like. It's not a bad thing to be with the people you enjoy, who make you feel good. And what we tend to find really good excuses not to do that. 
And because of the holiday season, it makes me think, it's like, how much time will we spend in the holiday season with people we don't like? <laughs> right? Isn't that great? I love that about the holidays. It's like, oh, shit, I got to do this social obligation? And again, that's that, that, there it is, that communal bubble, right? Where you go, am I doing this for some abstract purpose? Oh, I need to do this to advance my career, go to the office party, or, or I need to do this to make peace with the neighbors, or I need to do this for some other like sort of Machiavellian sort of uh, 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 reason to achieve some, ab again, abstract goal, or am I doing it for concrete things that will feed me, that will make me healthy, make my community healthy, make it more beautiful, help the environment. And, and, and that sort of balancing it that way, I mean, one of the things that Nietzsche talks about is that everybody acts as if they're like these uh, immoral ambassadors and diplomats with their lives. That we're just trying to you know, conquer various nations and make various winning deals rather than live a healthy, true life. We're always doing the right people. Everybody does in their mind, well, if I do this, I have to do that. Write these sort of trades off in my, rather than saying, well, is this really going to feed me, make me feel healthy? And then, of course, we've all been in the room, if you haven't, good on you, where you realize that everybody is only there because everybody else is there and everybody is making everybody miserable simultaneously, <laughs> which is why alcohol is so important in life. <laughs> Right, commence the drinking. Uh, you know that sort of, and you know. Uh, but again, to ask profoundly, why? What am I? What am I doing to make that necessary? To feel necessary, and is it truly necessary, or is it just again a pursuit of some abstraction that is really not that great? Maybe it is necessary. Maybe they're saying, okay, I'm going to do this, and that'll help me achieve some goal. A uh, person I know is going to graduate school just finished the GREs. GREs are just like the SATs, except for even stupider and more pointless. <laughs> but you have to do them if you want to go to graduate school. So, you know, I can sort of say, I was talking to him about this. I was like, you know, I can see where this might be one of those things where you go, okay, I need to do this. It's not going to be pleasant. But for an overall goal, great. I can feel good about doing it. I want to do well. And then I can go on to my next step. I'm like, okay, great. That's a very human decision. It feeds you in a larger sense, even though in the moment it's incredibly stupid. But at some point, if every moment is incredibly stupid, but the larger sense is incredibly stupid, <laughs> right? When, when does the incredibly stupid stop? That's the, you know, uh, yeah, so those are, those are the questions that Nietzsche wants us to struggle with. Not that the struggle is going to stop, by the way. This does not resolve all struggles. It just moves the terrain from am I meeting God's expectations, hard to tell. He doesn't send notes very often. Um, two, am I meeting my own expectations that grow from me and my life and my body and my environment and the people that matter to me? And so just these simple ideas of look to the body, look to the earth, and God is dead, substituting your body and your world, your environment. It's this central core assault on the whole program. That's why Nietzsche is so radical and so hard even today for people to kind of figure out what the hell he was up to. Well, what's his political program? Yeah, he just hated everybody. I mean, he was a total elitist like Schopenhauer. He just said, you know, look what the masses are doing. It's crazy, so forget them. But he also wasn't like the aristocrats should run the show. He's like, no, if you're dumb enough to try to run the masses, you're just one of the crazy masses. You're just one of the crazy masses that's in charge of the crazy masses. So his political program was to leave all political programs, basically, which makes him a bit of an anarchist, even though, of course, he wasn't an anarchist either. He just doesn't track onto our conceptual way that the world is laid out because he was appealing to himself. And, and so that's the idea. So from Luther's original liberation, which I think is primarily the mindset we still operate with, I would argue, even today, even when we've gotten rid of a lot of the religious trappings, although we still have a lot of them, we've poured in nationalism and other abstractions like this. But it's that liberation that I should be a member of and have access to a greater spiritual abstract, something directly. 
got rid of that Catholic Church that was the intermediary. I get to vote. I'm a member of a democracy. Yeah, great. You're a member of the Catholic Church. Right? Luther, great, right? And Nietzsche's like, yeah, got to, got to get rid of that. And so it's not a small break. When he says God is dead, it's, it's the spiritual God of Schopenhauer and Hegel, the whatever the hell Kant was up to, his, his bizarrely abstract sort of Newtonian ether-like God, and certainly specifically the God of Luther, and to replace it with us. So uh, just a, a total transformation. So Luther and Nietzsche. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.